Spark Books here. Today, I'm going to explain the book, The End of College, by Kevin Carey. Take care, enjoy the book, and have a nice day. The End of College, 2015, is about the American higher education system. These sparks give a historical overview of how the author sees the development of the American university and its evolution from European models. He evaluates its current status and advocates for the university of everywhere, a remotely accessible university of the future. Key idea number one, online higher education has arrived. Realize, American higher education is unsuitable. It delays degrees, causes dropouts, and limits subject content. Studies support this. Two-fifths of college students failed to graduate in four years. After six years, two-thirds had not graduated. The U.S. Census confirms, 35 million 25-year-olds dropped out of college, according to the 2014 census. What about students' intended skills? Aram and Roxa surveyed students from a variety of U.S. institutions. After two years of college, 45% of pupils had not advanced in fundamental courses, communication, critical thinking, and analytical reasoning. 46% of college students made no statistically meaningful progress after four years. There's a way. It's the university of everywhere. New learning method. Free online courses will be accessible 24-7. It'll also be fairer. It's not just a finishing school for the rich and indebted. Online, there are no overheads, hence no debts. This future isn't wild. Everywhere university is here. The author took MIT's introductory biology course, MIT. MIT and Harvard founded EDX created the class. Online classes are the future, so what went wrong? Key idea number two, early institutions focused on students, but this changed. When and where did universities start, or even their values? They were originally student-focused. Students founded Bologna's first university in 1088. They employed teachers on contracts that modern professors would balk at. Strict rules applied. Punctuality was required and teachers couldn't cancel class. They were also punished for low student attendance, which indicated that the teacher wasn't engaging pupils in previous courses. The Renaissance and Enlightenment changed things. Traded knowledge. Universities soon exploited students' ambition. You might learn from a lecturer or buy books. This generated a supply and demand learning market. Thus, universities sprouted everywhere, focusing on academics rather than students due to market constraints. The second oldest university is Paris. Canon law, theology, and medicine professors formed faculties. Universities were always popular. As intellectual capital owners, professors became gatekeepers. They could restrict enrollment. Because they accumulated literature, these colleges became better products over time. Since hand copying books was tedious, they were scarce and expensive. Students wanted these books for their knowledge. Students lost learning control. Key idea number three, the printing press shaped American universities. Gutenberg's printing press educated Europe in the 15th century. It may change the knowledge economy's power balance. Books were cheaper, more widely circulated, and occasionally affordable. Changed? No. Academic power remained unchanged. Contrary, the printing press solidified university business structures. Books were cheaper, but most couldn't afford them. Even then, students required teachers. The university paradigm focused all brains. No guidance existed outside the ivory towers. Thus, this required university enrollment. Professors instructed you what to read and students fought. All books were in university libraries. U.S. universities adopted this strategy. In 1636, British immigrants founded the first college in Cambridge, Massachusetts. After alumnus John Harvard's large contribution, it was renamed Harvard College. Not Harvard. By 1765, America had nine colonial colleges. Early colleges resembled English ones. American colleges were founded differently afterward. In England, universities were supervised by national law, while in the U.S., states ran institutions and took a more relaxed approach. States granted charters for colleges but did not fund them. American universities become privatized by themselves. Nearly 250 U.S. private universities existed before the Civil War. Key idea number four, three principles underpin American university. What should a university be? Who should it teach? Subjects? Three founding concepts influenced U.S. institutions. These ideals created three types of universities, land-grant, research, and liberal arts. The 1862 Moral Land-Grant Act named land-grant universities. This act allowed each state to establish universities using federal lands and their income. These institutions trained workers in agriculture and mechanics. They were job-focused for industrialization. 
Wilhelm von Humboldt and early 19th century Germany are associated with the second principle. Research institutes propose this. Von Humboldt sought scholars focused institutions. They advanced human knowledge, while students learned from them. Continental Europe adopted this model. The third principle founded liberal arts universities. Cardinal Newman of Britain, a contemporary of von Humboldt, inspired these. Newman said universities should share universal knowledge. Students won't advance science and philosophy. Universities explained the world to Newman. Therefore, these universities taught several subjects. Students learned broadly rather than specializing. Newman's paradigm prevailed in English-speaking countries. No US model prevailed. Universities still have elements of all three paradigms. Key idea number five, Charles William Eliot invented the hybrid university and education market. Hybrid universities exist now. They're not just research, training, or liberal arts organizations. Charles William Eliot, former Harvard University president, created the hybrid approach, 1834 to 1926. Eliot felt that pupils should first learn to observe and contemplate before becoming world-class chemists, doctors, or lawyers. His regular bachelor's degree developed these skills. Harvard's professional and graduate research programs required a bachelor's degree because Eliot believed only mature students could compare and reason. A bachelor's degree covered English, foreign languages, mathematics, philosophy, and science. Thus, liberal arts universities and research institutes suit perfectly. The former were the latter's training. Bachelor's degrees taught more broadly. Graduate students could study certain fields with specialist lecturers. This graduate school model resembles von Humboldt's research university. The bachelor's degree had no specified curriculum. Eliot preferred student choice. Eliot's concept was replicated by other colleges, creating a thriving undergraduate education market. His idea that pupils might choose interests was popular. Universities hired more academics and built impressive libraries and departments. Student recruitment was key. This growth cost some colleges. The wealthiest and greatest colleges become gatekeepers for wealthy students. Creating a two-tier structure violated the hybrid concept. We'll examine these problems next blink. Key idea number six, American institutions charge high tuition but don't care about pupils. American education is deeply flawed. The room has some enormous elephants. First, the hybrid university has a distorted focus. Research dominates undergraduate instruction. Three principles aren't equal. College professors, who are usually doctorate candidates or PhDs, are never properly trained to educate students. That's been true for centuries. Universities were and are focused on researchers in their areas. They train to focus on research, not teaching. It's smart economically. They don't make money teaching undergraduates or getting good teaching evaluations. Academics get paid for publications and lab results. While universities don't want to teach, college is pricey for most students. MIT, annual tuition is $42,000. Books, housing, and other expenses require $15,000 more. Because MIT is prestigious like Harvard and Yale, it may seem pricey. Low-ranked pupils also face substantial costs. A bachelor's degree costs $100,000 or less elsewhere. Still princely, especially when inadequate teaching standards mean students will exit college with limited or no learning. Current system flaws are obvious, but the university of everywhere could solve this ancient model. Key idea number seven, flexibility makes up for close teacher-student interactions at the university of everywhere. Imagine getting degree credit at home in your cozy comforter. The university of everywhere allows it. You might overlook its flaws. Negatives first. The institution of everywhere lacks face-to-face student-teacher interaction compared to the hybrid model university. Let's not overstate the benefits of teacher-student interaction. Hybrid universities have untrained instructors. The university of everywhere interacts via computer screen. You and your teacher may be on different continents. You can email the teacher, but they can't adapt the learning experience to your preferred approach or ability. The University of Everywhere excels in flexibility. Study whenever and wherever you choose. No more sitting bored or fatigued in a lecture hall with a quiet teacher. Turn up the volume or come back at the University of Everywhere. Consider the author's experience. He took EDX biology. He paused, rewound, or fast-forwarded the talk. Students who need work for tuition also gain. This model makes making up missed lectures and seminars easy. The University of Everywhere needs work. Its advantages over the antiquated American universities are evident. Future is apparent. American universities must change. It's come a long way, but now it doesn't teach students correctly. IT solves it. The University of Everywhere will serve a new consumer market. To view more content like this, subscribe. Don't forget to like and turn on notifications. The channel really benefits from it.
I appreciate you being here.